Um, and it's good, it's good to see you, at least those of you who are in town and back in town. Um, so here's the plan. Uh, hopefully you picked up a sheet on your way in. Uh, as we speak, uh, I will give you what the blanks are. If you want to follow along that way, you can. You're not obligated. You can completely put that down and just listen. Um, the verses are going to be in here. Uh, there'll be some things that I'll reference, so you might want to take out your phone or your Bible. You can follow along and double check. And um, what we're going to do is, one of the things that we do around here, we've been doing for, I think, three years now, is uh, at the beginning of the year, we pick a word. Uh, everybody picks a word. The church picks a word. Uh, just one word to give us something to kind of filter life through as the year goes on. Um, and so, rather than doing a whole series, just so you know, we're only doing this one day that we're talking about just one word. And to remind you, um, because some of us, some people I know have already talked and they've already picked their word. They, they know what their word's going to be for the year. Uh, I know last year my word was go. Um, I didn't know what that would mean or anything like that, and by the end of the year, i I'd gone to Swaziland and uh, had gotten to teach discipleship over there, see like lions 10 feet away from me, it was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and the reason I said yes to that is partly because what God was doing and my word was go. So you, you kind of have to go when you get the opportunity. Um, but many of you all have already kind of picked your word, but I want to just remind you of how you pick your word and why. And so I'm going to start by just giving you this one little piece right at the top of your page there. You can write it down if you want. But when we say my one word, okay, when you and I say that, it means actually his one word for you. Okay, because you can pick a word and say, I want to be, you know, let's just pretend, okay, there's plenty of people who are going to be going to the gym. And, uh, and it's the beginning of the year, they're trying to get healthy, and the gym will be packed. And for those people that have gone all year long, they hate going to the gym at this time of year because there's all these other people who are going to slowly taper off, but they're there and it makes it busy. But let's say you, you wanted to lose weight. You don't pick the word slim. Okay? You might not even want to pick the word healthy. Unless that's God's word for you. And so I'm going to explain this a little bit more, but I want you to make sure you understand that you're not just picking a word, okay? God wants to do something in your life, and he wants to do something with your life, and he wants to do something with you. And so you might want to include him when you pick your word. In other words, you might want to let him pick your word. So if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn. You've probably heard this story before. It's in uh, Luke chapter 10. And it's the story of Mary and Martha. And like I said, you've probably heard this before, um, where one of the sisters is working, the other sister's sitting, they've got company over, and the sister who's working doesn't like the fact that her sister is sitting. And so she goes to Jesus and complains about it, and Jesus says, you don't quite understand this. So let's, let's read how it actually goes. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sisters left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Just stop right there, okay? Do you ever, have, you ever have this happen in your house? Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's your kids. You know, you ask them to help pick something up. You say, hey, can you guys come help me, you know, clean the kitchen or something like that? And the first ones there are always the ones who say, why me? What about them? How come they don't have to clean the kitchen or something like that? This is exactly what Mary's doing, or Martha's doing right now. What, what about her? Why do I have to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Okay, now, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to 
look at this, and what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to look at this story and go, oh yeah, well that's me, I'm Martha, I'm the bad person. Okay? Or I don't want you to look at this story and go, hey, hey, I always just hang out with Jesus, I'm Mary, I'm the good person. Okay? That's, that's not the point. There's a reason that this story is here, and, and the reason isn't about Martha or Mary. The, the reason the story is included in Scripture is because it tells us something about Jesus. And so, here's one of the things that we need to know. If, if you're starting the year off, if you're going to try and figure out what your word is, you need to know, and again, you can write this down if you want, but you don't have to, but you need to know that everything starts with listening to Jesus. Everything starts with listening to Jesus. If you want to pick a, a word for this year, it starts by listening to Jesus. Okay, now, we talked about people who go to the gym and stuff like this. Sometimes you mishear things. Okay, and maybe you've seen this. Uh, it's been a meme. It's, it's been around where uh, somebody says, oh, exercise while they're at McDonald's and they're eating some supersized french fries. They said, exercise? I thought you said extra fries. It's not hearing right. And sometimes we don't hear right. We don't hear what God is saying to us. But Jesus is the one who's talking, and he says, Martha, you're worried and you're troubled and you're anxious about many things. But one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen the good portion. It's not going to be taken from her. So, as we enter this year, I don't know what happened last year and what you're trying to escape, get past, get over, and move on from. I don't know what you're hopeful for for this year. But I do know this. That if you are not listening to Jesus and what he might have to say about last year, about this year, about right now, you're going to miss out on the good portion. Because that's what Mary was doing. She was just sitting and listening to Jesus. So, let's walk through this. If you're going to have a successful 2016 and pick a good year, or a good year, pick a good word, not like you get to choose the year. Although, I did see this, I thought this was pretty funny. It's a good thing Apple doesn't like set the calendar because otherwise we'd be selling, celebrating 2015S. Some of you get that because you have apples. Um, so, since my wife is in children's church, this is when I always take the opportunity to tell stories about her. And so... Um, and you promise, right, this is just between us? You promise not to share it with her? Because I heard that mocking, sure. Okay, I'm keeping my eye on you, Hazel. What's that? You do that, you do that. Um, so there's, there's this thing my wife does, okay? She is, she's a very busy person, like... If she wore a Fitbit, she'd have like 28,000 steps every day. And that's just as a homeschool mom. If she actually went for a jog, she'd have more. She, she just, she doesn't like to sit. Um, she, she can't come and watch a movie without bringing something to do. You know, she's got to have her computer because she's working on something. She's got to have, you know, yarn and her, her crochet needles because she's got to do, like, it's just not going to happen. And, and she's the first to get up if, you know, if, popcorn runs out, oh, well, darn the movie, I'll just go make more popcorn, because I love my kids, and she does, and it's great, and, and, and I appreciate it, um, but there are times that she has so many things going on up here that she doesn't either get them out verbally, or she doesn't actually complete them, because I'm sure you've, you've done this before, where you you think to yourself, I need to go get whatever, and then you realize, where is the whatever? And so you head to whatever room has whatever. And about halfway there, you notice something that you'll have to do on the way back, and so you make a note. So here's what it looks like. Oh, I have a hangnail. I need to get the clippers. The clippers are in my bedroom. Let me go get the clippers. And you go into the bedroom, and as you're walking through the living room, you notice that there's some stuff on the floor over there. And, uh, and maybe, in, like in my house, it's dog hair. So I'll have to get that when I come back. 
And, and then you turn the corner and you walk past the kids' room and you realize their clothes aren't picked up and so you're like, I'm going to have to remind them to do that. And by the time, it's only two things that have entered your mind, but you get to the bedroom and you're looking for, what am I looking for? Why am I here? Okay, so this is the story of my wife's life. She has so many things going on. So what she does, I, I make her coffee some days, or she makes me coffee because we like coffee. And she likes her coffee really hot, like burn your lip hot, okay? So I make her coffee, it comes fresh out of the coffee maker, and then I put it in the microwave for like another minute, okay? So she likes it really hot, which means she only drinks about this much, and then it's too cold, so she needs to heat it up again. And so she takes the coffee and she puts it back in the microwave, which is what I call the timeout. Because if I go to make something in the microwave, coffee's already in timeout. And she forgot that she has coffee. So, like, I'll come... And I'll come into the kitchen and I'll have to, you know, make something and, honey, would you like your coffee? And, you know, you can taste it and it's cold. It's been in time out for an hour. Or just the other day, literally, we just, we just, I just made her coffee. She had some, it was already in time out. And I saw it in time out and I asked her, do I need to just bring you your coffee or do I need to heat it up again? She goes, I don't know couldn't even remember. And then she came into the kitchen to get her coffee. Said, she says, I'll get it. That's literally what she said. And she comes into the kitchen to get her coffee. She's like, why am I here? Okay, so here's a question, husbands. What do you do when your wife does that? Just think, and wives, look at your husband and Figure out what you think he'd do. Because here's what the sensitive, loving Jason does. <laughs> How do you not remember what you're doing? You literally walked like eight feet from one room to a room where you could already see the microwave. We just talked about coffee. You haven't even had another conversation, and you can't remember why you're here. I'm going to have so much fun when you're old. That's what I do. Now, why am I telling you that? Because my wife does a lot of things really well, but she also does a lot of things. And when she's trying to do a lot of things, she forgets things. We've found gifts that were for years before. We've found money that people have given to us in cards that we were about to throw away because I forgot to take the money out. I forgot to cash this check. Like... I mean, so we're constantly finding stuff, okay? I'm sure we'll find Christmas decorations even though we've taken them down because somebody put them in a safe place. But if you're going to do that, you're kind of bumbling and mumbling around a little bit like Martha, and what we need to do is not get distracted by doing too much. When it comes to one word, we pick one word, one thing to focus on so that we don't get distracted by trying to do too much. Because like a lot of people who start the new year, they think, okay, what are my new year resolutions? And they come up with ideas of things that they want to improve and they have this whole long list. And, you know, like I said, one of them might be the gym and I want to I eat healthy and I want to I wanna use kind words. I don't want to yell at my kids anymore or... You know, I'm going to uh, take the stairs instead of the elevator or, you know, I mean, not like in Greenville that matters, but you know what I mean. And they just make this whole long list of things. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to read the Bible in a year. I'm going to pray every day. I'm go and so they have this big long list and at some point it becomes so long that you do a few of the things on it and then you forget that there were other things that you were supposed to do and by the time that you remember you're two, three, four, five days behind or you're 16, 17, 18 pounds heavier and you're like, forget it. Don't get distracted by trying to do too much. This is why we pick one word. And Martha was distracted because she was trying to do too much. Think about this. If Jesus showed up at your house, okay, and you might not even really understand or know who Jesus is. You might not really know who Jesus is. You might know Jesus is a really good guy. They wrote a book about him, you know, bestseller kind of thing. And, but if Jesus showed up at your house, would you spend your time in the kitchen? Or would you, like, go hang out with Jesus? Like, would, would you, and here's what I know about some of you, 
you would you'd be like, oh my word, I can't believe he came over. I haven't cleaned up. I've got to just, don't come in here yet. I've got to get it straight. And you're in there wiping down counters in the bathroom because you wouldn't want him to see what a real house looks like because he's probably never seen that before. And you're cooking something. And you're making sure the coffee's ready to go. And you're, you're totally missing it. You're distracted by doing too much. So if you're going to change that, what do you have to do? You have to focus, and so I'm going to give you a few things that you could do instead. You already know this one. If you've ever been here and you've done my one word with us before, here's what it is. Do something about one thing instead of nothing about everything. Do something about one thing instead of nothing about everything. Because if you're anything like me and a lot of other people that I know, when you look at this and you're like, you're just overwhelmed with life, all of the things that you have to do, a lot of us tend to go, maybe I'll start tomorrow. It's just too much. I don't even know where to begin. Okay, well then, don't. Just pick one thing. Do something about one thing instead of spending your year doing nothing about everything and saying, well, I'm, I'm going to do better next year. Okay? So, Martha's here. Jesus comes to her house and she says, oh, I'm so glad to have you, Jesus. Have a seat. And then she goes and takes off and she's doing stuff. Well, her sister is hanging out with Jesus. And it says right there, Martha's distracted with much serving. She was doing too much. And so she goes up to Jesus. And what did she say? I mean, it's in your notes, so you don't have to tell me. She says, Lord, don't you care? Okay, now that right there, some of you asked that question last year when things didn't go the way that you wanted them to. You may have said, God, don't you even care? And those of you who are a regular part of Discovery, you know that there were plenty of things where, um, you know, when, a, when an unborn baby dies the day before it's supposed to be born, it's pretty easy to ask, God, don't you care? Do you even care? Like, really, why does stuff like this happen? So we, we've experienced that but it's really kind of a silly question. Don't you care? Yeah, God, God actually cares. But he says, she says, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So here's what she's doing. She's doing something that a lot of us do that I'm going to challenge you to not do. She's making comparisons. And so what I'm going to challenge you to do is don't mess with the comparisons. Don't bother with it. Don't go there. You can write that one down if you want to because it's in your notes. But don't mess with the comparisons. Now, why do I say that? Because it's going to get you in trouble. Here's, here's what that looks like for me. So, Laura and I, we've lived in a few places. We've, you know, been pastors and on staff and, and so we've got a lot of friends. She was in the military and so we've got people all over the country uh, and you get Christmas cards because that's how you keep up with people because obviously, you know, I don't visit Kansas all the time or Oklahoma or Texas or whatever, you know, so friends send you Christmas cards. And these are friends, a lot of them that we went to church with and uh, there's one couple, the Dawsons, who, uh, who I really, I love them uh, because they were one of those people who, um, they have a, like, before Jesus and after Jesus life that is radically different. Like, before Jesus, they were just completely different people. And now, after they've met Jesus, they're completely different people. And so, when we met them, they had just a few kids. I think I may have even told you about them before. They had a couple kids, you know, about the same age as, uh, as my boys. And, um, and, but then they just kept having kids, you know, and people thought we were weird when we had five, and then they had six, and then they had seven, and they were the ones who, like, when they had number seven, they named him Ethan, Ethan Nathaniel Dawson, because the letters spell end, and, and they did that on purpose, literally, and then they had eight, and then they had nine, and then they adopted two, and, and so they've got, like, 11 kids now, and you, and you get their Christmas letter, and you see what's going on, and you're like, wow, I'm... I'm not doing very much. You know, they're adopting kids from the Ukraine, giving them a new life. <laughs> they're raising their kids to trust the Lord. They're, their kids are, you know, you just kind of do the comparison game. Or it's not just them. They've got this other family, the Daniels. They also have nine kids. I think it's nine. I don't know. I can't count. 
but you know, like their oldest son is going to college now, and he's got a commission to West Point. Like, wow. And and you know, you know, here's here's something I understand. I understand that you only put the good stuff in the Christmas letters, right? You only put the good stuff. Like, my kid did this and this and this. And what you don't tell them is your kid did that and that and that. But I sit there and I read them and I'm like, man. You know, and it's not like I'm disappointed in my kids. You know, Tyler's doing pretty well. Tanner's doing pretty well. Chandler's doing pretty well. I'm not disappointed in them. But I play this comparison game and go, oh, man, but maybe they'd be better. Maybe I could be better. Maybe I should do more. You talk about what other couples have done and how they've served the Lord in this capacity or that and where they've gone and what they've done and ministries they've started and all this kind of stuff. People they've seen come to faith that they've discipled and you go, man, I haven't done anything. I play the comparison game. Don't mess with the comparison game. Don't mess with the comparison game. What should you do instead? Well, here is what you should do instead. We should seek closeness with Jesus, with Him, instead of competition with others. Now, I want to point something out here. When, when Martha said, don't you care that I'm doing this all alone? Don't you care that I'm doing this all alone? I'm guessing that in a room this size, there's a few people who have at one point or another, maybe even today, felt alone. And nobody likes to feel alone. You don't like to be singled out. Or at least most people don't. Maybe you've been left out. Maybe you have been left. And so you feel alone. And Martha feels alone. Like she's the only one doing anything that matters. Let me, let me tell you something about Martha. Martha doesn't understand that sometimes it's okay to serve the Lord alone to stand alone. If you've got your Bible, I want you just to turn a few chapters later to chapter 17. And in chapter 17, there's this little story, and I'll just summarize it for you. It's uh, chapter 17, verses uh, 11 to 19, and it's the story of ten lepers. Okay? You can read it for yourself, but I want you to know where it is, because here's what happens. Jesus comes across ten lepers. Okay, lepers are people who uh, have a... uh, a highly contagious, um, disfiguring skin disease, okay? And it could be any number of things, but there's, it's highly contagious and it makes you look yucky, okay? There's actually a camp song that I remember singing, you know, leprosy, I've got pieces falling off of me, that kind of thing. Um, it's not a, not a good thing. And people obviously didn't want to be around lepers. And yet Jesus was willing to be around lepers and he, and he sees them, and he says, go show yourself to the priest, and, they, and they're healed. But then there's something in that little story that you might want to pay attention to. In verse 15, there were ten of them, remember, in verse 15 of chapter 17 in Luke. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, and praising God with a loud voice, he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, we're not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And Jesus sent him on his way and said, you're well. You got two ways of looking at things. You can look at things as though you're alone and everybody's left you. Or you can look at things as if you're alone and God has left you. This one may be right. This one will never be right. People may leave you. You may feel alone. You may feel like you've been abandoned by people. And that could be right. Maybe you have been. But God will never leave you. And so here's an instance where Jesus sees one person doing one thing who's just serving him. He says, that's a good thing. And you'll note, we'll come back to this in a minute, that Jesus never condemns Martha for the work that she's doing. She feels alone, she feels abandoned, she she wants somebody to help her, but no, it's okay. If you look at uh, chapter 9, there's this little story, chapter 9, verse 49, where one of the disciples comes and says, hey, Jesus, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, should we tell them to stop? 
We saw someone, just one person, casting out demons in the name of Jesus, but he's not a disciple. He's not one of them. He's just alone. Should we tell him to stop? And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. Anyone who's not against us is for us. Let him keep doing it. It's, It's okay to be alone. It's okay to be alone if you're focused on closeness with him instead of competition with others. And so when you're picking your word, don't get distracted by all the things that you want to work on that you think would be better, make you a better husband, a better wife, a better uh, student, a better employee, a better employer. Don't, don't focus on all of those things. Everything starts with listening to Jesus. So don't get distracted. But also don't play the comparison game. It's a, it's a, a dangerous thing. It's not necessarily wrong, but it's a dangerous thing to look around this room and go, I wish I could be more like him or her. Because if that's where it stops, you've totally missed Jesus. And we don't want to miss Jesus because he has something even better than what he or her has. So, when Jesus makes his explanation and he answers her and he says, Martha, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things, but but one thing is necessary. Mary's chosen the good portion, which isn't going to be taken away from her. When you're choosing your word, I just want to encourage you to choose or make a good decision. Choose the good portion. Make make a good decision. And I'm going to give you, this is non-biblical kind of stuff, I'm just going to give you some points some things to ponder, some things to consider that might help you choose your word. And you've got, we will share, you know, like we did last year, we will share our words on January 31st. So you've got like a whole month to go through this and to to listen to Jesus, to not get distracted about a whole long list of things, just focus on one thing, to not, not compare yourself and say, I'm not good enough here or there. No, 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 just listen to Jesus and make a good decision. So here, here's how you can make a good decision and choose the good portion like, uh, like Mary did. Sit and listen. Do that first instead of go and do. Because here's how it normally works. We sit and we think. We don't listen. We make a list of things that we want to improve and then we immediately go out and do it. And so many of you have started a Bible reading plan. And that's great. Good job. And when we get to about the 15th or the 20th, if you're choosing a long one, and you haven't done it, you're either going to be discouraged or you're going to start over because you want to do it all right. It's not about that. Sit and listen instead of just going and doing. And it's okay to be healthy and go to the gym and eat well and all that kind of stuff. That's good. And you can do that. But don't make that your singular focus. Sit and listen first. And so... Here's a few questions. You can see that where they are right there, but I'm just going to walk you through them, okay? So as you're trying to figure out your word for this year, number one, you need to sit. And when you sit, when you, what you're doing is you're looking in, okay? You're looking in and you're giving the Lord permission to look in to your life. And you're saying, Lord, what do I need? What do I need? Okay, it's not what do I want. And you're asking God, what do I need? He might, he might say you need patience. I don't know. But he might say you need boldness. He might say you need to uh, speak up. He might say you need to be quiet. I don't know, but what do you need? God, what do I need? God, what's in my way? As you're looking in, you're trying to figure out what's in your way. Now, maybe it's some internal thing like, you know, it's pride, it's bitterness, it's unforgiveness. You know, maybe there's something negative that's in your way. Maybe there are some people that are in your way. God's going to ask you to just not spend as much time. Maybe it's your phone that's in your way. Maybe it's Facebook and electronics. I don't know. You don't have to listen to me. You listen to him. And you're looking in and you're asking, Lord, what do I need? What's in my way? And then what needs to go? And just ask him, what what needs to go? And so as you you keep a thought on those things, then instead of just sitting, you're going to listen and continue listening, but then you, you don't have to do much more than that. You just listen. And he might not speak right now. Some of you, he spoke months ago because you knew we were doing my one word. Some of you, you're struggling. You don't know what he's trying to say. That's fine. Listen. You don't have to know right now. He does speak. And here's the thing you're going to ask him. 
what do you want to do in me and through me? What, what do you want to do in me and through me? When we look back at the story, Mary and Martha are sitting there. Martha's cooking. Mary's sitting and listening. Mary chose the good thing. Why? Why was it the good portion? I don't know. Maybe Jesus wanted to do something in her or through her, and the only way he could do that if he had access. And Martha was hiding in another room, so Jesus couldn't do anything in her or through her. So, ask God, what do you want to do in me or through me? And then, you're going to live. At some point in here, you're going to get the idea that God has a word for you. A word. Just a single word. And, and here's, again, don't play the comparison game. Because some of you will get a word and you'll think, well, that's stupid. And you don't actually think it's stupid. You just think other people will think it's stupid. You know, because you're a 50-year-old person and you're, you're picking a word that you would expect a 15-year-old to pick. You know? I don't even know what cool words are anymore. I've got teenagers living, I just don't know. So, we, you know, we'll just back up to the 80s or something. Rad. Okay? Maybe you think that's going to be your word, rad. But you're like, I can't pick that. I'm too old. If that's what God is saying, you might need to pick it. Okay? What do you want to do in me and through me? And as you live, then you're going to look out. And, and what we're going to do, and the reason that we share it in January is want to know who are you going to share it with and then how are you going to remind yourself? Okay, so last year what we did is when we picked our words, we all got together here, we, we, we basically made like an 80-pound piece of artwork. Okay, because we all got tiles, little tiles, and you wrote your word on it, maybe a verse or something like that, and then we put all the tiles together to outline the church's word last year, which was seek. And then we made this big, huge thing, which, you know, we've put up a bunch, but now it's going to the office, okay, because it was heavy. Okay, well, here's, here's the plan uh, of this year, at least the tentative plan, unless somebody comes up with a better idea, but here's what I'd like to encourage, Okay. If you use Uversion, which is your, a Bible app for your phone, you can make verse images, okay? So if you have a verse that uh, goes with your word, something that would remind you of it, I'd like you to make a verse image and save that verse on whatever picture you want. You can use your own picture. If you use Instagram, you can use Instagram. If you do any, anything, basically what we want are digital pictures of your word and we want to collect them so that we can use it as a reminder. We'll pick a few every week, and we'll just put them up in the pre-service loop. Maybe once in a while we'll throw one out on Facebook. We might use the church's Instagram, but we want to remind each other of what our word is and maybe what the verse is that goes with it. And so start thinking of how you can creatively, digitally, okay, it's much lighter than tile, digitally, create a reminder that you can share with us. So, who are you going to tell? How are you going to keep it as a constant reminder? And I told you I'd come back to this as far as the story. So, let me just recap where we're at. Jesus shows up in town. Martha invites her in. Him in. Jesus is a man. Martha invites him in. Mary sits down to listen to him teach and Martha goes to work. But she gets frustrated that she's the only one there. And so she comes and complains to Jesus, well, don't you care that I'm the only one doing anything? Well, my sister sits here, why don't you tell her to do something? And Jesus says, Martha, you're troubled and anxious about many things. But Mary's chosen the good portion. It's not going to be taken from her. Regardless of who you are, I want to encourage you that if you're a busy, distracted kind of person, Jesus doesn't condemn her. He doesn't say you shouldn't serve. He doesn't say stop it. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say you're doing it wrong. As a matter of fact, if you didn't know this, Martha shows up again. Martha is the sister of Lazarus who was um, a man who died and was dead for four days before Jesus showed up and Jesus comes and he says, I'm the resurrection and the life and he raises him from the dead. You know, it's the one where one of my favorite King James words, so like, hey, roll the stone away. He's been in there four days. He'll stinketh. But he comes back to life. 
Martha's his sister. And so Martha's there having a conversation with Jesus. And right after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 12, there's people gathered and what do you see? Martha. What is she doing? Serving. It's, it's just part of who she is. Martha served. And so Jesus doesn't condemn her for what she's doing. And He doesn't condemn you for how busy you might be and how much you want to improve your life. I want to get closer to God. That's good. But here's what you need to remember. You and I need to remember this. It's much more important to spend time with Jesus than do things for Jesus. And so, if you've chosen to, uh, you know, make it a regular habit to be at church, that's awesome. But if you're just here at church for Jesus, but you're not here at church with Jesus, you're missing it. And if you're going to read your Bible and you're going to pray more, that's awesome. Keep doing it. But if you're just doing it as a checkbox for Jesus because you think that's what he wants from you, but you're not doing it with Jesus so that you can hear him, because everything starts with listening to Jesus, you're missing it. Because it doesn't matter where you go or what you go through, everything starts with listening to Jesus. And you can do that because Jesus is always with us. When we celebrate Christmas, we say, Emmanuel, God with us. That didn't change. So whatever you went through last year, whether you felt alone or not, Jesus was with you. And whatever comes this year, Jesus will be with you. I want us as a church, I want you as an individual, I want your families to actually experience the fact that Jesus is with you. Because I'll be honest, there are plenty of times that I don't, okay? I get frustrated and I'm not nice. You can ask my kids. Like, ask them. I should probably ask them first so I know how they'd describe it. But I'm not going to because I know what I'm like. There are times that I just get in a little pouty fit because it's just been a cruddy day. Is that right? Look, at they're smiling right now. They're, oh, yeah. Okay? So 40, whatever I am, 44, yeah, 44-year-old Jason acts like a 4-year-old Jason when I don't have a good day. And I'll like, I'll like drop hints. Like there are times, you know, when I'm angry at one of my kids because they didn't, they didn't clean something or they didn't do something that I asked them to. Like I literally think in my head, well, I ain't buying you any presents then. Oh, you want food? Well, I ain't cooking anything. I'm only cooking enough for me. You can get your own food. Jerk. This is what I'm thinking about my own kids. And here's, here's what I'm forgetting. That in the middle of that, Jesus is with me. So, does Jesus want to love me so that I'm not so frustrated with my kids? Yeah. And so whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you encounter this year, Jesus will be with you. It's a promise. He said it at the end of Matthew before he left. Lo, I'm with you always. I don't know what lo means. I don't know why he said that. He actually didn't. He spoke a different language. But we translate it lo. But basically Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to be with you always. Even to the very end of the age. And so as you pick out your word, as we, as we pray through this, would you please start with just listening to Jesus. You can come on up here, Kev. Now Kevin's already been listening to Jesus. He's got a little something that he's going to invite you to do with him because he's been listening, okay? And uh, I would encourage you to do that. But while we're getting ready, let me just pray for you and pray for us um, that we would hear God. And we would hear him say, hey, you might be busy and anxious about it, but you don't need to be. Just choose the good portion. Just come and sit and listen to me. Hear me. And so, Father, I thank you that you don't want more from us. You just want to do more with us. And, Father, I pray that the way that you love us would be the way that husbands love their wives. We don't want more from them. We just want to be with them. And vice versa, that wives love their husbands and God, help us to understand how much you desire to be with us to the point that we would hear your voice. God, help us to hear what you have to say to us. Train us to hear your voice. And Father, we know that you 
did not come to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so when we hear things like, you're not good enough, it's all your fault, well, you'll never be and fill in the blank. God, we know that comes from the enemy. And I pray that you would replace those words with words of life. And God, at the end of this month here, you would make sure that everybody in this room has picked one word. Not of their own, but the word that you picked with them. And I pray that it would help them to become the people that you want them to be. Because you're going to walk with them through whatever it is that this year has. So we pray your blessing, we pray that we would hear your voice, and God, I pray that you would do something even bigger than we would ever dare to ask, hope, or imagine. We pray for those that aren't home here with us uh, this week, that the rest of their vacation, their travel, and all that kind of stuff would go well. Uh, you'd get them home safely, and Father, as we enter into this new year, that we would see your hand in our lives and on your people. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.